Warning, this video might offend some people. My name is John. I'm going to talk about why prayer doesn't work. Now, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and I agree to an extent that prayer doesn't work. What? I'm also going to talk about why that's an inaccurate statement to begin with, that prayer doesn't work. What? I just contradicted myself a couple times, right? How can I be a Bible-believing Christian and say that I agree to an extent that prayer doesn't work, and yet also say that it's an inaccurate statement to make? Makes no sense, right? It's a contradiction. In fact, maybe a double contradiction, right? Well, I'm going to take a few minutes and kind of explain what's going on here. Explain what I mean. The goal in this video isn't to convince anybody of anything. I'm not trying to prove anything, but I've heard so many mistruths and so much misinformation that I wanted to kind of share some light, share some understanding, kind of help some people to see kind of what maybe what's going on here. So that's the that's the goal of this video. And again, it might it may it may offend some people, and that's okay. So uh, I'm going to just start by saying, maybe I'll ask the question, what are we looking for with prayer? What are we, what are we using prayer for? Are we trying to use prayer to get what we want? Or to get the outcome, a desired outcome that we want? When I say that I, to a degree, agree that prayer doesn't work, that's what I'm talking about. If we're using prayer to try and get the things that we want and to try and manipulate God, then prayer doesn't work. What are we using prayer for? Are we using it to, to for, so for those things to try and get our way, to get what we want, or is there maybe a deeper, bigger purpose for prayer? When people say that prayer doesn't work, it's essentially a self-defeating thing to say in that regard. Because if you have various people praying over the same thing and they each want something else, maybe they each want their own outcome, there's a, there's a conflict there. I hope that makes sense. Whenever I've heard people make the claim that prayer doesn't work, it's been from a context of people not getting what they want, or God not doing what they think that he should do. How often, are, how often are our desires based on selfishness and us getting what we want? I'm going to list a couple of scriptures, maybe a few scriptures. I'll try and keep it short. There's a lot I could say about this, and the Bible actually says a lot about what's going on here. Maybe not directly, sometimes indirectly, because there's a bigger picture involved. But the Bible says a lot about what's going on here and the purpose of prayer. It may be inconvenient for us, though, because of its implications, inconvenient to our selfish nature. Let's jump into the Bible. Let's look at a few verses, and then maybe I'll tie them together. First one I want to look at is the book of Psalm, chapter 37, verse 4. Psalm 37, 4. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What is that saying? Or maybe we should ask, what is it not saying? What is it not saying? It's not saying he's going to give us what we want when we want it. He's not saying, it doesn't say he's going to do what we think he should do. It doesn't say that. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's a cause and effect, essentially. Make the Lord your desire, make the Lord your delight, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. Now, if you combine that with other scriptures, it helps paint the picture even more. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, at the end of verse 7, says, Man judges outward appearance, God judges the heart. Well, if God judges the heart, what does that imply? It implies that he knows our heart, he knows what we want, he knows our motives. 
Maybe one of the reasons why prayer seems to not work sometimes is because we ask for self for things for selfish reasons. In fact, if you combine that with Proverbs sixteen twenty five, chap Proverbs chapter sixteen verse twenty five. That says there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. Which sometimes it's talking more about spiritual death than it is physical death. What are the ways of man? Man tends to be arrogant, selfish, irresponsible, lazy. How many problems in this world are caused by man's selfish pursuits and selfish desires, his self-centeredness. A lot of them. How many less problems might we have in life if man were not irresponsible, were not self-centered, weren't lazy? Are we using prayer to try and to, to try and get God to fix our problems, problems that we cause? to try and relieve ourselves of responsibility. James chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 say you want but you do not have and so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with selfish motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. If you focus on kind of on the, the tail end there, the the last couple lines of that of that set of verses, what's it saying? It seems to be saying directly or indirectly that we often ask for things for selfish reasons. We want the things that we want. And yet we have the you know, the pride, ignorance, and arrogance to say that prayer doesn't work simply because God doesn't go along with our selfish plan and our selfish desires. Maybe there's something much greater and deeper going on here. What if it's not about us and our desires? What if it's about Jesus and knowing him? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Again, that's Psalm 37, 4, chapter 37, verse 4. Let's look at a couple other scriptures here. The book of John, chapter 16, verse 33. says, I, ha I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's Jesus' words. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If you combine that with John chapter 14, verse 27, it says a similar thing. It says, peace, again, Jesus' words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What's the emphasis here? We're seeing some patterns here. In those two scriptures, in the Psalm 37, 4, we're seeing some patterns. And some emphasis. Is the emphasis that God will give us what we want? No. Maybe sometimes he does, but that's not a guarantee. That's not the emphasis. In fact, if you look at John sixteen thirty three, the one we read a second ago, it says, in this world you will have trouble. Life's going to get challenging. You will have difficulties. Now it doesn't. Now notice something here. It's easy. There's a lot of a lot of implications in these scriptures are easy to miss. In this world you will have trouble. What is that implying? And again, maybe we should ask, what is it not saying? It doesn't say how many troubles we'll have. It doesn't say the degree or the amount of trouble that we'll have. It says you will have trouble. It doesn't say if you'll have a lot of serious trouble or just some light troubles. It doesn't specify. It says you will have trouble. You will have problems. Where are we getting our peace from? Where are we getting our joy from? Is it from our circumstances and from us getting what we want? Or is our peace and joy coming from the Lord? 
Now, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, this may be, these, these scriptures may be challenging to grasp, and it, may, and it may seem like foolishness, quite frankly. There's actually, there's various scripture in the Bible. The one off the top of my head is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I forget which verse. I want to say it's 17, but it's like the latter half of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about a veil of, a, a veil of blindness <clears throat> over our eyes. The eyes of people who don't know God. Basically saying that without God and without God's help, some of these things will seem like foolishness. They won't make any sense. We need God to reveal the truth to us and for it to at least, at least make some sense. So what are these scriptures so far? What are they referring to? What, what are they saying? Now they're saying that, again, God is going to give us what we want, that he's going to bless our selfish desires and our selfish pursuits. It doesn't say that. Maybe that's not what prayer is for. What if it's about seeking him and trusting him, even maybe even especially when things don't make sense? It seems that people want to try and make sense of things sometimes, and when, when God doesn't make sense to them, again, we have the pride and arrogance to say that, well, he's not doing what I think he should do, and things aren't turning out the way I think they should, or what makes sense to me, so where is he at? He's not, he's not talking to us, he's not answering, he's not there, and, my, and prayers aren't working. If you look at Isaiah uh, 55, 8 and 9, Chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. If you look at Job, chapter 11, verse 7, I think it is. Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. It says that his ways are, I'm paraphrasing, I'm kind of combining them all together. They say that his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Who can fathom and who can understand the mysteries of God? Let's also look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, as well as James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, I believe it is. Or 2 through 4, I think it is. As well as Romans 5, chapter, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. What do those say? Kind of the same thing, different words. Rejoice in our suffering. Do not be surprised when suffering comes upon you. I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but that's what they say. Rejoice in your suffering. Do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you. That's what First Peter says, chapter 4, verse 12. The James verse and the Romans verse essentially say, let us rejoice in our suffering. That makes no sense from our human perspective, from our limited selfish perspective. How can we rejoice in suffering? Maybe God wants to use our suffering for our good and his glory. How can he how can we use how can he use our suffering for his glory? Maybe when we go through suffering it draws us closer to him. As crazy and foolish as that may sound. Now I'm in no way making light of tragedies and suffering. There's a there's a lot of stuff. I mean there's seemingly endless suffering in this world all over the place. I'm no I'm not making light of that at all. Where's our joy coming from and our peace? Is it coming from our circumstances and things always going our way, getting what we want, getting the outcomes that we want? Or is our joy coming from the Lord? And knowing the Lord? And letting him be our peace and our joy and our strength. Where is it coming from? Is that what we're using prayer for? To try and manipulate God? Or are we using it to know God? I remember about two to three years ago, I was in a situation where some things in my life weren't making sense. 
And I was very frustrated because some scripture seemed to contradict my own, what I was experiencing in life. It wasn't making sense to me. So I started talking to God about it. And he answered right away, immediately. And the things that he told me were inconvenient to my selfish nature. Because they, I, they, he was showing me ways that I needed to change. And he was showing me my responsibility, what I had done to create this situation. It was nothing that he had done. It was everything I had done because I had been in some ways selfish. And so he started showing me ways that I had been selfish and ways that I should change. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't change. I've tried to change. I've tried to make myself not selfish. But I can't. But Jesus can. And I've experienced that firsthand. When I when when I delight myself in the Lord, when the when I make my when I make the Lord my joy, He changes me. He'll change your life. He's changed mine. But again, that can involve that essentially involves surrender, which is inconvenient to our selfish nature. When we surrender to the Lord, he'll start to do things in us. He'll start to change us. Does that mean that he'll start to give us what we want? No. He'll start to change us, though. There's so much more I could say about this. I'm going to wrap it up in a moment here. But what are we using prayer for? If we're using prayer to try and manipulate God and get what we want, then prayer doesn't really work. Because that's not what prayer is for. If you're going to use a hammer to try and chop a piece of wood in half or to try and cut a piece of wood, a hammer's not designed for that. So, of course, it's not going to work. If I'm using a paintbrush to try and start my car, it's probably not going to work because that's not what it's meant for. That's not, a paintbrush, is not, of course, is not used to, to, to start cars. I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence by saying that, but if you use something for something different than what it was created for, or than its purpose, it's not going to work. So when we use prayer to try and manipulate God and get what we want, it doesn't work. If we're using prayer to talk to God, a different story. I would challenge people to try talking to God. It may be inconvenient, partly because it involves laying ourselves aside and laying our selfish desires aside and submitting to him. I would inv- I would challenge people to try, if you're watching this, try, talk, try talking to God, seeing what happens. And I would challenge you to do so with an open heart and an open mind. See what happens. I challenge you to have the courage to do so and to to have the courage to confront your selfish desires. It's challenging. Believe me, I've been there. I get it. I still have my, I still, I still struggle with that every day because I'm still a human being. But I challenge people to confront, to try and confront that, try and confront our selfishness. And talk to God about it if you need to. He wants He wants you to ask for for His help. Because we can't do it on our own. So I challenge people to do that. I'm going to leave the comment section. I'm going to turn off the comment section only because I've seen what often happens in comment sections when it comes to maybe offensive videos like this or um, maybe, for lack of a better way of saying it, controversial videos like this. And it tends to get ugly. Verbal fistfights, etc. That's not what I want. So for that reason, I'm going to be turning off the comment section. 
I hope this has been a little bit helpful. I hope this is, it's probably been an inconvenient and challenging and probably offensive, like I said. But what are we using prayer for? If we're using it to try and manipulate God, it's not going to work. If we're using prayer as a as a means of knowing God and talking to him, as a way of delighting ourselves in him, then it's a different story. Take care.